Hi everyone, and welcome to God's Plan, Your Part, a podcast where our goal is to read the entire Bible in a year, seeking to understand God's plan of redemption while discovering daily and practically your part in it. Hey everybody, welcome back to God's Plan, Your Part. Today we are looking at Numbers 14 and 15 and then Psalm 90, uh, which could be like, what? That doesn't make any sense. But we are doing a chronological reading. And one of the cool things to me about chronological readings is you do get to see the Psalms in the context of the stories that happen to cause the writer to write them. Uh, so Moses is assumed to have written Psalm 90. And so his, his Psalm in Psalm 90 is kind of in response to Israel's disobedience. Their current situation. So it could, it could be that it happened, you know, at this exact time. It could be that it happened a little bit later. But at any rate, the Psalm is like set in context. Scenes. Yeah, it it's is like kind a- of. This but is how I'm actually feeling. Let's get back to the crazy now. That is my favorite re- way to read the Psalms. Um, obviously, David wrote a lot of the Psalms. So when we get into the life of David, we'll be reading a lot of Psalms like as he wrote them. And it just it helps me understand them much better. I don't necessarily personally resonate really well with the Psalms. I'm not against them. They're just not my favorite. They're easier to read. <laughs> um, so I like seeing them in context. So just to set the scene here. Uh, Numbers 14 is following up on the the spies saying, like, we cannot go into this land. And so God is going to be like, fine, if you don't listen to me, like, you're not going to go into the land at all. Your kids will, but you won't. Well, there's something interesting about that, though, because Caleb and Joshua are part of this said crew. And they come back and they're like, hey, it actually wasn't that bad. Like, they're faithful. chill out. They're like, if God's on our side, like, why wouldn't we do what he says? Mm-hmm. Um, and then you get in chapter 15, uh, I'm, I'm guessing you're going to want to talk about the Sabbath breaker. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of an uncomfortable story. Uh, and then Psalm 90 is, it's an interesting Psalm. Like a lot of times I think of Psalms is like worshiping the Lord. This is an interesting Psalm that asks you to count the days of your life and live your life in view of the fact that it will end. And like God is sovereign over it. So as we read through all these things, it feels like I just set the scene for quite a while. Uh, what do you want to talk about, Jenny? Well, I was telling Ryan a little bit before we started this episode, it, a lot of what we're seeing with the Israelites and their disobedience or the word grumbling comes up a lot. It reminds me of just being a parent myself, where we set up like certain expectations of our children and... They know the expectations, but often disobey or or grumble or complain. And there's like warning after warning. And if we get so many times of doing whatever the thing is, there's going to be a consequence for it. And I think we're starting to see that um, with the people kind of calling out against Moses, calling out against God. And even God at one point says, like, how long are these people going to despise me? How long are they going to keep, like, trashing my name after I've I've delivered them from Egypt? And we start to see a little bit of God's judgment um, coming out, especially in chapter 14, where he says, all those people who um, doubted me or are thinking that this is a terrible plan, they just want to go back to Egypt, like, they will never enter my promised land. And it, it does feel like that kind of like that role that we have as parents too. Like, well, if you're going to continue to do this behavior, then you're going to pay the consequence later. And that's just, that's the, the correlation that I made when I was reading through this. As you talk about grumbling, uh, I rem- I'm reminded the, we're going to hear the word grumbling a lot. Grumbling becomes a, a favorite sin of the Israelites. Um, and it, I think it's a sin that we common fall into as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, it's different in our culture and context. But the root, the, he, the Hebrew root of the word that's used for grumbling is actually like abhorrence. So mm-hmm. there is a little bit happening in the word, because this was written in Hebrew. It wasn't in, written in English, mm-hmm. obviously. A little bit of what's happening and being represented in the words of the author is that they actually like hated that God was their God. So it Well, was, I mean, that's pretty obvious because it even says, like, take us back to Egypt. Yes. And, like, that was a place full of other, like, other gods. idols, They gods. lived under other gods. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there is, like, there is an obvious, like, they're annoyed, they're frustrated. Um, but when it says grumble, it actually has, like, this idolatrous element that's mm-hmm. like, I don't want to serve you anymore. I want to go back to where I was. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm sick of following you, God. And that is why grumbling like sets God off so quickly 
because it's not what you might normally think of grumbling, just being like frustrated. Bleh. It's <laughs> like, no, I hate you and mm-hmm. I don't want to be with you. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's pretty serious. And God reacts to it <laughs> pretty seriously uh, to the fact that Moses is like, hey, listen, you can't just destroy all these people. Uh, we'll see this happen a couple times. And so you were you were somewhat concerned about Moses being able to change God's mind. Yeah, it was weird. Um, basically, God is like um, super disappointed in these people. I don't know like how they can turn their backs on me after all these things that I've done. And then it goes into this whole section of Moses basically saying like, don't do this or the Egyptians are going to hear about it and... Like, it's just like this strange conversation between God and Moses where it seems like it seems like Moses has more authority in the the conversation than God does. Like God's so off the rails or something that Moses has to bring him back. It's just really (laughs) weird. It is interesting. I've been reading some stuff um, about how God exists for God's glory. Like God loves God. And he's not, sounds a, so weird. <laughs> he's not a person. He's not like us. Mm-hmm. Um, he has all authority. He has all power. He has all majesty. He is holy. We are not. So he is actually the center of the universe. We are not. And so God is welcome to exist for his own glory. And so sort of what Moses is doing is saying like, God, like you glorified yourself in delivering us as your people. You have chosen us as your nation of priests Like, you can't just destroy us because then everyone's going to be like, oh, God is dumb. Like, that God's not powerful. He's not holy. He's not majestic. And so Moses almost, in a sense, reminds God of how much God loves God. Um, And I've heard this many times. It's like, well, God is in the Old Testament is like selfish or jealous or insecure. He's not like us. So that... It's just not even fair to be like, oh, he seems like somebody I wouldn't want to be friends with. (laughs) It's like he's the creator of the universe. He's allowed to do what he wants to do. We follow him and worship him because we understand that he is our creator and we should do the things that he's asked us to do and live the way that he's asked us to live. And so because he is holy and powerful and mighty, we want to bring him glory. And when we bring him glory, we actually live out our lives the way that we are intended to live them out. Mm -hmm. So we actually live our best lives when we are glorifying God. Um, So I think that's that's a concept that is at play in these passages. That's why it feels strange when Moses is like, God, what are you doing? Um, Oftentimes I ask myself, like, is this, did Moses already know that he wasn't, like, did Moses... Um, pleading with God, did God already know that he was gonna relent? And like, this was like Mm -hmm. something that was stretching and growing for Moses. Um, I tend to believe that way. I think, uh, is it possible that Moses pleaded hard enough and changed God's mind? That seems odd to me, but it does seem to be what the passage implies. So I'm not sure. I don't have like a fast theological Mm -hmm. thing to teach on this other than like, yeah, there's some odd stuff going on in here, but I do know that um, God is the most important thing, the most powerful thing, the most like God is my God and I serve him and I worship him. And so it, it doesn't really bother me when God is like, Hey, I'm in charge. Well, what's interesting after that is Moses kind of hands off the message from that conversation to the people saying, all of you people who doubted, you will no longer see, um, the promised land. Your chi- it's interesting though, because he said the children, uh, twenty years and under, yeah, would not be impacted by that. So it's kind of interesting that like the innocent still have a chance yet. Yeah, it's all the, it's all the people that have been counted. So we kicked off numbers with mm-hmm, a census mm-hmm. of everybody twenty years and older, and so those that are twenty years and older now are judged. And I think this is kind of an interesting concept that is lost on us. I think t- the theme of today is concepts that are lost on us. Um, God forgives sin. Even in the the Old Testament, we've seen like the system of forgiving sins. God forgives sins. Sin still has consequences. So just because you're forgiven of sin doesn't mean that you don't live in the results of it. So like you, you have right standing with God. God restores your right standing with him. But sometimes you have to walk out the consequences of disobeying Mm -hmm. God. Well, what's interesting though, like as you move from that, the people were kind of like, well, no, like, we'll go back. We'll go to the land that he promised. Like, yeah. it's okay. We'll just go. And Moses is like, don't you do that. Like, the Lord's not with you. 
His presence is not following you. If you go down there, you're going to get killed, like, by the, what did they say, the the Canaanites and the Amalekites. Um, but they just are just like, whatever, we're just going to do it anyway. So they go down and are immediately overtaken and defeated. So in Leviticus 26, uh, Leviticus 26 is like blessings and curses. Mm -hmm. And the first half of Leviticus is if you honor the Lord and you follow his statutes and you obey his commands, he will like fight for you and he will provide for you and he will look out for you and he will be your God and you will be his people. But also in Leviticus 26, he promises, like, if you turn against me, I will remove my hand from you and your enemies will kill you. You will run for no reason. You will starve. Like, you will live a terrible, terrible life. And so we're seeing that play out. Like, they're like, fine, we'll go take the land by ourselves. And Moses is like, dude, like, don't do <laughs> don't that. Don't do it. Don't be dumb. And so we see that a lot of people die at the hands of those living in Canaan because mm-hmm. the Lord was not fighting on their side. Well, because of their original disobedience. And like, that is the consequence of the sin that they had committed. Exactly. Another consequence of the sin is that, that these people have been judged and they cannot go into the promised mm-hmm. land. And they're actually going to descend into like this crazy cycle of disobedience. Mm-hmm. And I think I was telling Ryan earlier, this is like the starting of this like really bad habit that they get into. And the consequences, even in our next reading for tomorrow, is going to be much more severe than even this, I would say. Yeah. Um, it's like pretty much just like, oh crap, God is not happy with his people and this is going to be the consequence. But before we get there, <clears throat> we do have <laughs> chapter 15. And something that really caught my attention um, was chapter 15 verses, let's see. Yep. Verses 15 and 16. It says, for the assembly... There shall be one statute for you and for the stranger who sojourns with you, a statute forever throughout your generations. You and the sojourner shall be alike before the Lord. One law and one rule shall be for you and for the stranger who sojourns with you. And this is like really cool for me as I was listening to this passage, reading it for myself, because it, in my mind, often the Old Testament, God was just like all for the Israelite people, but There is such an effort made to include strangers and sojourners because it says, it straight up says, like, the rules are the same for you and you shall be alike before the Lord. There is no, like, weird favoritism going on at all. It's like, serve God with your whole heart and you are the same before the Lord, just like these people who are chosen to represent who God is. So I thought that was really cool. I really appreciated that. It just, it kind of cleared up some odd misconceptions that I had of like God's character and people outside of the Israelites. So we've seen many times now, like Egyptians left Egypt with the Israelites. Mm -hmm. Uh, They crossed the Red Sea with the Israelites. They were under God's protection and blessing. Uh, Just a couple days ago, it might've been literally like two days ago, um, God says that sojourners can celebrate Passover just like everybody else. Um, Hobab, the Midianite, is encouraged to go with Moses to the promised land to enjoy God's blessing in Mm -hmm. the promised land. So God is just constantly, constantly allowing people who are not Israelites to enjoy the community of the Israelites. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And I don't think that we've grown up with, at least you and I, haven't grown up with a healthy, holistic picture of what this community of Israelites looks like. Um, because God did choose the Israelites to be his people, but he's also allowing anybody that wants to worship him and mm-hmm. follow him to be part of that blessing. Right. And so, like, I guess sometimes just the way you read it or sometimes the way it's recounted feels like, oh, only Israelites get this. But if That's you actually read it, it's like, yeah. wow, there's a lot of other people included in this. Um, I don't want to shy away from this. There's an odd part of chapter 15 where this guy... Um, violates the Sabbath by going out and picking up sticks and starting a fire. And they arrest him and they bring him into custody. And Moses goes to God and says, what are we supposed to do with this guy? And God says, hey, he needs to be put to death. Everybody in the community has to stone this guy until he's dead. Um, it's so weird. It's, I don't like it's this an one. odd passage. So how did you feel reading that? I just felt really turned off because... Uh, my instant thought whenever I hear about stoning, because this is not the first instance we've heard of stoning someone, um, it's just like, I don't want to be the person that has to go out and do that on behalf of what God says need to be done right now. Like, 
killing somebody because they made a fire just seems so wrong to me and i can't like it's it's hard for me to wrap my head around god wanting someone to like just be killed by people chucking stones at them that just seems really wrong so this is an odd passage for sure i don't want to shy away from like yeah it feels uncomfortable like like it is odd there's a couple of things i want to call out and help bring context to so if you think about like what when this is happening so like the people have just like out and out disobeyed god god has judged them publicly and now this guy is like openly disobeying the sabbath um that's there's an indication there of what's going on uh, one of the footnotes in the study Bible says that this guy seems to be like making a scene and purposely disobeying God in a big way. Um, it doesn't seem like this is a wise choice. It seems like there's more going on here than just violating the Sabbath. Do you know what gets me though? Like I come back to the, cause I, I, okay, that, that puts a little bit more clarity onto it, but at the same time, like we will see in chapters to come where God just like swallows people up in the middle of nowhere or like <laughs> takes them out with fire, whatever. Like why put that responsibility on people to kill someone? So this is, this is a communal society. Uh, we are no longer a communal society. We're very individualistic. And so the fact that they are a communal society, uh, it, it has a lot of its own implications and, and actually like a lot of God's people are communal people. Even the church today is supposed to be like a communal knit together, um, corporate identity. And because we've become so individualistic, it's like, well, well, that guy, like that guy shouldn't affect me. Like if he, if he does something wrong, that doesn't mean that affects me, but that is not the understanding before God. That's why they have to, that's why actually uh, also in chapter 15 is how to offer sacrifices on behalf of the whole community. So the idea is if, if one person sins against the community, that affects everybody. And so one of the concepts that's being played out is this individual sins against the community and against God. And so the punishment is carried out by the community before God. Um, this guy Sinning intentionally before everybody is a threat to everybody, and it does affect everybody. I, uh, the thing that's coming to my mind is like a little leaven ruins the whole loaf. Mm -hmm. And so we don't think that way anymore, and I think some is lost on us because of that. Well, and our reading tomorrow actually talks about a man and how his decisions it does impact his in his entire tribe. Or, yes. And they literally get swallowed up. Well, you think even, room. even in the new Testament, like it, it's not like Jesus came and God stopped doing this stuff. Like Ananias and Sapphira lied to the entire community and God judged them immediately because that was dangerous to the community. So what kind of stuff do we see like that today? Like, cause we always talk about God is the same as he was in the old Testament. I, I think particularly church discipline, like we don't take it very seriously anymore. Mm -hmm. And it is very, very painful for people. Um, one, because churches don't do it well, but two, because people don't do it well. So you have somebody that sins publicly in a church, somebody that sin, like it comes out that like, hey, like you're living in sin. We need to deal with this. We're not a communal people anymore. So that strikes all of us as like, oh, that's gross. Why would that church do that? Uh, but God has actually called us to do that because we are a set apart community. We should not be like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so when somebody in our community sins, it does affect all of us. And so one of the things I think that you can see just in Western church is because we become so individualistic, like the communal spirit is missing. And there is this feeling of like, hey, what's good for me is good for me. And what's good for you is good for you. That's not God. That's the world. Like God is saying, Hey, I'm calling all of you to worship me and honor me together. And if one of you is struggling, that actually affects all of you. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I can think of many examples today. Um, all of them are very personal, so I won't share them. Um, but I can think of situations where like individual sin affects the community in a very significant way. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do think some of our theology is lost because, we don't think of things this way. We think, we think, I mean, our context is Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Like we think through things in a very American individualized, I can do what I want to do. You can do what you want to do. And it doesn't affect anybody else. It's just not true. Mm -hmm.
Does that make sense? Like, yeah, well, how's that does. striking you? No, I, it definitely does. It's a little bit easier to chew that way. Um, but before we we move on to our part, because we are definitely running <laughs> Sorry, crazy guys. today, uh, we can take a look at Psalm ninety. And I just, when I hear this, uh, this section is entitled now, this is stuff that has been added, but it says a prayer of Moses, the man of God from everlasting to everlasting. That's what it's been titled. Chapter 90, uh, Psalm chapter 90. But when I read this, it kind of just sounded like Moses to me, Moses just throwing his hands up in the air, like, God, just please come soon because this is so much to handle. This is so much to bear. Um, and just like, I guess, understanding God's power because he talks about being swept ab- swept away like a flood. Um, we are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath. We are dismayed. And it. I just feel really bad for Aaron, or for, for Aaron, for Moses, um, because he just keeps asking, have pity on us. Um how long do we have to keep wandering? Um, so, yeah, this one just makes me feel like it's just poor Moses just crying out, like, please make it stop. It's an interesting segue. Like we were just talking about community versus individual. Mm-hmm. All of the context in Psalm 90 is community. Mm-hmm. It's all mm-hmm. plural. Mm-hmm. So this is a prayer of Moses, but it's all us, our yeah. It's all plural language. Let so, the favor of the Lord our God be upon us. Establish yeah. the work of your hands upon us. And so assuming this psalm is written by Moses, Moses is processing all of this plurally mm-hmm. as a community. So it is funny. It just kind of seems like this last hurrah of Moses, like, oh, God, this is terrible. Take us out if you need to. But if not, please let your favor just rest on us. <laughs> I think of Paul. Paul says to live as Christ and to die as gain. Like mm-hmm. Moses here is obviously dejected and he's like, I would love to be with you, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but if I am not going to go be with you, like, please have favor on me while I struggle through these days. We, as we strive to honor you. It is like, imagine if I was in this situation, I am not praying. We, I am not praying our, I'm praying God, please help me. Mm-hmm, I mean, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. literally praying that a lot this week. Please help me. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know what to do. Please have mercy on me. Please lead me. <laughs> Moses' prayer is, please have mercy on us. Please lead us. Well, he's literally watching people just kind of fall to the wayside and just give in to their, their own longing for comfort and familiarity. And just watching God just, okay, bye. See ya. You're not part of this anymore. You're rejecting me. So here's your consequence. Crazy. So I bet that would be real. I mean, think about the number we talked about when they originally left. What was yeah. it? It's like 600,000 men or something. Oh. Well, yeah, including in the millions, all, yeah. including all the women and children, yeah. And they're just kind of falling off left and right. So I think for a your part today, there, there's many places we could go. Some of them we've already hit. One, God has a heart for people who are not part of his people. Like he loves outsiders. He wants to bring outsiders in. Mm-hmm. Um, another is, man, we live at our best when we are under God's will. And so when he tells you not to sin, when he tells you to live your life a certain way, when that is spelled out clearly in scripture, there's no wiggle room, there's no wiggle room. And it's foolish to think that you're going to do better outside of that. Like these, these people said, Mm -hmm. we can't go there. That's that, that is too dangerous. That is that. How dare you require that of us to go to to that place? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's like, man, you, your life would have been so much better in God's will under God's design. Mm-hmm. And so there are many, many things and examples that you could use that are like, hey, I think your life will be better in God's will. Uh, the thing that is sticking out to me today, I think probably because we talked about the longest, is that um, the Bible is written, I think, in a communal context. And I think it would be helpful for us to rediscover some of that in our own lives. So mm-hmm. like, how are the choices that I'm making affecting my community how are the choices that others are making affecting our community? Because it, it everything that we do affects our communal witness. I'm using the communal word so much that it sounds like I'm a communist. I'm not. Um, it's just we are part of a thriving community. Actually, Paul says that we are the body of Christ. How can a hand 
I'm going to totally butcher it, but like hand oh, and feet, they work together. They can't mm-hmm. work against each other. And a hand can't just decide like, well, this is what's good for me. I'm going to go off and do my own thing. Or a foot can't be like, well, I like going over here. So I'm going to go over here. Like we have to rediscover this sense of man, we are wholly united as the body of Christ. We are a part of one thing and each of us affects each of us. And so whatever we can do to rediscover like the joy of worshiping God together in one spirit, that's exciting to me. And I, I, I don't think we can just change our minds and do that and accomplish that tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do think it's something that we've lost and it's exciting to me to think about how to regain that. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's that's what we took out of today. I think we went very long. We apologize kudos to you that made it the whole way and we didn't put you to sleep or something cut some of that out (laughs) we'll see you tomorrow hey thanks so much for listening to our take on god's word stick around and listen to the word uh, on the second part of the podcast before we get in there uh, we just want to remind you you can connect with us at any time on social media and youtube at god's plan your part also we are a listener supported podcast so if you ever want to help us out with the ministry that we're doing uh, you can do that by clicking the link in our description and now here's the reading for today numbers chapter 14 Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or what that we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy it out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us... He will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of that land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? I will strike them with a pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make you a nation greater and mightier than they. But Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear of it, for you brought up this people in your might from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands over them, and you go before them, in a pillar of cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night. Now if you kill this people as one man, then the nations who have heard you will fame, your fame will say, It is because the Lord was not able to bring this people out of the land that he swore to give them, that has killed them in the wilderness. And now please let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying, The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of their fathers on their children to the third and fourth generation. Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live... And as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the test these ten times, and have not obeyed my voice, shall see the land that I swore to their fathers. And none of those who despise me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went." and his descendants shall possess it. Now since the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valleys, turn tomorrow and set out for the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord, 
What you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness, and all your number listed in the census from twenty years old and upward, who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore I would make you dwell, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones, who you said would become prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that I ha- that you have rejected." But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and shall suffer for your faithful faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity forty years, and you shall know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this I will do to all the wicked congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall come to a full end, and there they shall die. And the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing up the bad report about the land, the men who brought up the bad report of the land, died by plague before the Lord. Of those men who went to spy out the land, only Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh remained alive. When Moses told those words to all the people of Israel, the people mourned greatly, and they rose early in the morning and went up to the heights of the hill country, saying, Here we are. We will go up to the place that the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. But Moses said, Why now are you transgressing the command of the Lord, when that will not succeed? Do not go up, for the Lord is not among you, lest you be struck down before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are facing you. And you shall fall by the sword. Because you have turned back from following the Lord, the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the heights of the hill country, although neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed out of the camp. Then the Amalekites and Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and defeated them and pursued them, even to Hormah. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land, you are to inhabit, which I am giving you, and you offer to the Lord from the herd or from the flock a food offering or a burnt offering or a sacrifice, to fulfill a vow or to make a freewill offering at your appointed feast, to make a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Then he who brings his offering shall offer to the Lord a grain offering of a tenth of an ephah of fine flour, mixed with a quarter of a hand of oil, and you shall offer with the burnt offering." or for the sacrifice, a quarter of a hin of wine for the drink offering for each lamb. Or for a ram, you shall offer for a grain offering two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with a third of a hin of oil. And for the drink offering, you shall offer a third of a hin of wine, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And when you offer a bull as a burnt offering or a sacrifice to fulfill a vow for a peace offering to the Lord, then one shall offer with the bull a grain offering of three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with half a hin of oil. And you shall offer for the drink offering half a hin of wine as a food offering, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Thus it shall be done for each bull or ram, or for each lamb or young goat. As many as you offer, so shall you do with each one, as many as there are. Every native Israelite shall do these things in this way, an offering a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And if a stranger is sojourning with you, or anyone is living permanently among you, and he wishes to offer a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord, he shall do as you do. For the assembly there shall be one statute for you, and for the stranger who sojourns with you, a statute forever throughout your generations. You and the sojourner shall be alike before the Lord. One law and one rule shall be for you, and for the stranger who sojourns with you. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land to which I bring you, and when you eat of the bread of the land, you shall present a contribution to the Lord. Of the first of your dough you shall present a loaf as a contribution, like a contribution from the threshing floor, so shall you present it. Some of the first of your dough you shall give to the Lord as a contribution throughout your generations. But 
If you sin unintentionally and do not observe all these commandments that the Lord has spoken through Moses, all the Lord has commanded you by Moses from the day that the Lord gave the commandment and onward throughout your generations, then if it was done unintentionally without the knowledge of the congregation, all the congregation shall offer one bull from the herd for a burnt offering, a pleasing aroma to the Lord, with its grain offering and its drink offering, according to the rule, one male goat for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for all the congregation of the people of Israel, and they shall be forgiven, because it was a mistake, and they have brought their offering, a food offering, to the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord for their mistake. And all the congregation of the people of Israel shall be forgiven, and the stranger who sojourns among them, because the whole population was involved in the mistake. If one person sins unintentionally, he shall offer a female goat of a year for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement before the Lord for the person who makes the mistake when he sins unintentionally, to make atonement for him, and he shall be forgiven. You should have one law for him who does anything unintentionally, for him who is native among the people of Israel, and for the stranger who sojourns among them. But the person who does anything with a high hand, whether he is a native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among the people. Because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment, that person shall be utterly cut off, his iniquity shall be on him. While the people of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him in custody because he had not been made clear that he sh what should be done to him. And the Lord said to Moses, The man shall be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. And all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him to death with stones as the Lord commanded Moses. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember the commandments of the Lord to do them, not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. So you shall remember and do all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Psalm chapter 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as a yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream." like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are seventy, or even by reason of strength eighty. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to fear of you? So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and as for many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord be upon us, and establish the work of your hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of your hands. Thanks so much for listening to God's Plan, Your Part. If anything stuck out to you, if you have any questions, or if you'd like to receive a Bible, you can email us at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, please consider supporting us through the link in our description. We love that you're on this journey with us, and we hope you have a great day. See you tomorrow.